first account of events taking place between 2001 and 2029. This is a work of fiction. Names, characters, businesses, places, events, locales, and incidents are either the products of the author's imagination or used in a fictitious manner any resemblance to actual persons, living or dead, or actual events is purely coincidental. In 2020, a virus named SARS-19 spreads rapidly across over one and a half billion people. The SARS pandemic, however, is far from over. In January 2024, NATO, Russian, and Chinese troops returning home from the Middle East begin dying en masse, despite having received vaccinations to SARS-22. The new virus is identified as SARS-24. In the majority of cases, patients die suddenly after being asymptomatic carriers for several weeks. Two billion lives are lost to SARS-24 in 2024. The final case of SARS-24 is recorded on October 1st, 2027. The total worldwide death toll from the SARS viruses stands at over 4 billion. The following is a documentary presentation of those that have survived the SARS pandemics. These are their stories, recorded during 2029. Robert Wilson is not your ordinary Englishman. Called by Rolling Stone as one of the preeminent musicians of our time, his band Hamlet skyrocketed to fame in 2027, reaching number one in the Billboard charts in both England and America. He reached out to us from Newcastle while on a break from his latest virtual tour. Am I on? Yes, we're recording. Sorry, uh, what was the question? How did you survive the pandemic? Which one? Either the SARS-22 or the SARS-24 pandemic. Can I talk about SARS-19? Those are better days, you know, when people still had families and when people still had hope. Hope about what? That things would go back to normal. Not to mention you could still go to the grocery stores back then. <laughs> yeah, and uh, not worry about dropping dead or... <laughs> How are you going to feed yourself, or who's going to bring the next cough that's going to kill entire communities? Those were better days. Yeah, they were. <coughs> Sorry. Do you need a glass of water? No, no, I'll be fine. I'll just give me a minute. I was just... This damn... 
fever and cough hasn't gone away since 2020. <laughs> I'm uh, Dr. Tony Fremont, uh, and I'm a uh, former SARS-22 vaccine researcher. Uh, what exactly would you like to talk about today? We are making a documentary about how the world has changed and dealt with the SARS pandemics the last 10 years. Oh, okay. Well, I joined the uh, SARS Institute in 2023 uh, to join the team that was working on finding a a vaccine for SARS-22. Um, there was a world effort, a uh, concerted effort, to, uh, to find a vaccine because 600 million people were killed in three months. I mean, it was devastating. The global supply chain, I mean, I'm sure most everybody remembers that. Ah, the days of the great lockdown. Yeah, when the world government were forced to admit the truth. What truth? The the truth that the, the immune system didn't actually could not actually defeat SARS-22. It, it lay inactive, dormant, uh, but manifested itself in other ways that allowed us to realize what it actually was. And what was it? Some believe SARS was a bioweapon engineered to look totally natural. But I think that does a great disservice to the genius to evolution. I mean, it's it's gigantic hubris to think that we're the most powerful life forms on the planet. We're not. Dr. Freeman, however, is a minority voice. Not everyone believes SARS is a natural virus. We now travel to Langley, Virginia to meet Bill O'Connor, former Special Operations Commando and celebrated author of the book, How SARS All Got Started who, on an operation in the heart of the Middle East in 2022, uncovered evidence that implicated SARS was actually a genetically engineered bioweapon. Hello, Bill. Can you state your name and occupation for the camera to begin the interview? My name is William Connor. I'm a former contractor for the CIA, also a Navy SEAL Special Ops Commando. In your book, you wrote that you're on a mission that discovered the origins of SARS-22. Can you tell us about that mission and where it took place? Yeah, it took place in Iran. Our team was in the dark about everything. You know, except that we were extracting an asset of Israeli intelligence from the outskirts of Shiraz. When did you first learn that your mission would discover the origin of SARS? Not until the end of the mission. Well, at first it just seemed like a routine night op. Apart from being in the heart of Iran. In your book, you write that several of the helicopters went down on the way and due to anti-aircraft fire. How did you survive that? Yeah, most of us jumped out before the copters went down. But, to be honest, we were in the middle of a battlefield between the Iranians and the Israelis. It was a nightmare. You know, bullets flying and screaming and explosions. And how did your team how did you survive that? The Iranians are like the Iraqis in a firefight. A whole lot of bark, but very little bite. Plus, some of the copters that didn't go down were still operational. Your mission was just after Iran had invaded and annexed Yemen, Iraq, Kuwait, and Syria, correct? Yeah. That was a very scary time to be in the Middle East. You know, the northern flanks of the Iranian army somehow overrun the, the Kurds and the Turkish alliance and that progressed to the Battle of Istanbul. And by then the European countries started mobilizing like it was World War I all over again. Getting back to the asset you extracted, how did the rest of that mission play out? Well, our uh, copter had mechanical issues about a hundred clicks out from the Israeli border, so we had to dish the Black Hawk and travel the rest of the way on foot. <laughs> Normally, if you clash on enemy territory and travel on foot, it's a death sentence. But now during SARS-22, it was on that walk to the border that we started learning about the origins of SARS-19. The asset was an Iranian who worked for the Revolutionary Guards Bioweapons Division. He was sent to China in 2012 to retrieve uh, fecal matter of bats that contain hundreds 
of very dangerous viruses. He said that uh, the SARS sparked Iranians' interest because of its unique properties and how it can be modified to be the perfect weapon for asymmetrical warfare. The perfect weapon the religious zealots running that country could use to take down the world. William O'Connor is not alone in believing that SARS was a bioweapon. Our next destination is Oxford, England, where we'll be speaking with a former MI6 analyst who has published dozens of articles claiming SARS was part of an asymmetrical warfare program developed by a foreign power. Hi, Mary. Can you please confirm your name and occupation for the camera? Hello, my name is Mary. I worked for MI6 until the dissolution of the monarchy, but after the revolution in 2026, I found employment as a contractor for an agricultural automation company just outside of Oxford. You mentioned the dissolution of the United Kingdom. What was it like to experience the political upheavals of that time? It was absolutely god-awful. Young kids robbing their grandparents for a loaf of bread. Not to mention when the Irish army pillaged the English countryside during the global famine of 2025. Not a bloody soul there to stop them. All our troops had died after returning from the war in Iran. I remember the newscasts of London and Manchester burning during the hunger riots. Were you there? No. At the time, I was living at my family's cottage in the countryside to help my father. He suffered from Alzheimer's before he passed away of natural causes in 2027. You mentioned you worked for MI6. What was your job there? Before the revolution, my job at MI6 was to analyze the asymmetrical warfare capabilities of other nations. Basically to study how another country could conduct war using unconventional weapons and tactics. However, no one saw SARS coming. It wasn't until the second pandemic in 2022 that I think we realized at MI6 that we had been attacked. But by then it was too late. Most people in 2022 were looking for someone to blame and opinions about how we should have responded to SARS began to radically shift. How did that play out in the United Kingdom? Near the end of the second pandemic, people stopped listening to corporate controlled news pundits who kept reinforcing this ridiculous narrative that the mutations of SARS were naturally occurring. We were all so tired of listening to those peddling false hopes, whether of a herd immunity or a vaccine. Opinions shifted as the death tolls rose. And we started listening to common sense stop listening to propaganda. And what did common sense say? That only an idiot could believe that SARS was not a uniquely engineered bioweapon. What did you learn while working in the intelligence community about the family of SARS viruses? I didn't learn much back then about SARS, at least from anything we had gathered from actionable intelligence. I never had any research to back up my claims about bioweapons. But all you have to do is look at the facts of what happened to draw your own conclusions. The original SARS-19 was meant to spread, if you ask me. It was never meant to kill anyone the way it did. Just to infect as many people as possible, get the virus in them, so that it could lie in their spinal fluid, latent, inactive, and waiting. Waiting for what? For SARS-22 which would activate the latent SARS-19 after a short period of time. It was SARS-22 that was meant to pull the kill switch latent in SARS-19. And SARS-22 was the virus of all viruses. The virus that put Ebola, HIV, and all other viruses to shame. The sum of all fears. A virus with a 100% mortality rate no treatment, no known vaccine, and no way to know you've been infected until it instantly kills you. The summer of 2022 was the worst. Millions dying every day of sudden heart attacks, strokes, 
unexplained organ failures and immune overreactions. Do you think the Iranians developed this? Don't you think they would have known SARS would have come back to haunt them? No one knows with that predictic certainty it was the Iranians because any evidence, if there was any, was wiped away by nuclear weapons. However, assuming it was the Iranians, I really don't believe that whoever created the virus put much thought into how they released this pathogen or ever thought of all the ways it could come back to hurt them. I mean, we've all seen pictures of modern day Iran. You mean what was once Iran? Of course. The nukes made sure Iran was wiped off the face of the map and they even say the Chinese army went in after the nukes to make sure no Iranian lived to ever do what they did again. One would think, in retrospect, that if it were the Iranian Revolutionary Guard, that they would have given some thought to the precarious position this would put them in by developing such a pathogen. However, perhaps in 2014, the goal was to destroy America, to create a power vacuum which they could then exploit, after all, when you've nothing left to lose, all options are on the table. And that is the whole point of asymmetrical warfare. To create something that can destroy your enemy and which cannot be traced back to you. And the Iranians would have succeeded if the virus hadn't had such unexpected outcomes. Like the hospitals in Italy in 2020 being overrun or the virus running rampant in Iran itself. Some even speculate that the Chinese knew about the true origin of SARS-19, and that's why they shut everything down so swiftly. But we didn't have a clue at MI6, and neither did our friends at the CIA. Nobody knew back then, or that the worst was yet to come. You wrote in an online article that you believe SARS-19 was originally meant to spread like the common cold. Why do you believe SARS-19 was designed that way? This is not a fact. This is just my opinion. I don't believe SARS-19 was ever meant to show anything more than minor respiratory symptoms. I believe the virus was meant to spread like a common cold. SARS-19 was never meant to kill and cause the alarm like it did. It was meant to spread across the world, set things up for SARS-22 and target certain countries, finish the job in the event of a war. When did you come to the conclusion it was the Iranians? I always had my suspicions that SARS was a bioweapon developed by any number of world powers, the Russians, the Chinese, North Koreans, perhaps some Islamic terrorist group. But it was not until the Israelis recovered intelligence, which quite possibly proved it was the Iranian Revolutionary Guard behind SARS-19 and SARS-22, that I became convinced it was the Iranians. I was not the only one back then that arrived at this conclusion. World opinion turned on Iran overnight. They became the most hated country in the world after America. Some say that it was the Russians, French, and Chinese that nuked Iran because no one ever claimed responsibility. And to this day, no country, not even the United Nations, has even bothered investigating who nuked Iran. But if I had to bet, I'd say it was the Chinese because their forces were the first ones at the border. And because they gunned down the Iranian refugees trying to flee the radioactive wasteland. This will be an unpopular opinion. But at any other time, what the Chinese did to the Iranians would have been considered a war crime. But not now. Not after four billion lives lost to SARS. The Chinese genocide of the Iranians and the world turning a blind eye to it were nothing more than an unofficial conviction and death sentence. For a moment, just after SARS-22, the world lost sight of its humanity and let its blind rage and need for revenge supplant its ability to let go of wrongs done. 
we lost our goodness. We forgot how to forgive. And I think for future generations watching this, dealing with whatever blights your time may bring, I think the key is this. Hold on to what makes us human, to what makes us good, and never let that go. No matter how difficult things may seem at the time. You will get through it. Just as we will survive and get through this. My name is Nancy Adams. I'm 35 and I was a nurse during the 2019 and 2022 pandemics. I haven't worked since 2023. Well, not since the hospital shut down and never reopened. What was it like during both pandemics at the hospitals you worked at? The pandemic in 2020, in retrospect, was far worse because that's, that's when everything changed. We didn't have any warning, really. You would see horror stories on the news, but they were always somewhere else, far away. You know, not right here, right now. Not until March of that year when the lockdowns began. How did the lockdowns differ between those two pandemics? Mm, the lockdowns never really ended. I mean, the official lockdowns ended before the 22 pandemic. And some people tried to go back to some sort of normal, but it was almost impossible. Because people were sick? No, because people were afraid. I think that was the real disease back then. People stopped going out. They started hoarding and stopped shopping and stores began to close. Not because of the lockdown, but because they had no customers. That wasn't normal. However, at, at work, there was always some sort of normality being around people dying every day as crazy as that sounds. But I felt the most normal working at that hospital during the first pandemic. I became used to seeing crowds of people in the hallway unattended and dying on the floor. Dying because doctors were busy or, or they didn't have anything to help them. And that became normal because that was what I expected to see. But when the grocery stores began running out of almost everything and it was becoming impossible to find a deodorant stick and people were walking around smelling of bad body odor or, or when the vivid dreams started of eating a fresh tomato or even driving to work on the highway and seeing abandoned cars everywhere. That was when I realized that things had changed and they were never gonna go back to the way they were. And what about the pandemic in 2022? More people died in that pandemic, some say close to two billion worldwide. How was that less horrifying than the 2020 pandemic? The the SARS-22 pandemic wasn't less horrifying, but it was different. The hospitals at that time were more quiet and people were afraid to go to the hospital. And I remember sitting in my hazmat suit and waiting and no one was coming in the ER and I was just watching the news, reporting how, how bad everything was getting worldwide. Why were all the hospitals so empty? Was it because people were afraid of contracting SARS-22 at the hospital or because of something else? Everyone was afraid of contracting SARS-22, not just at the hospitals, but everywhere. Outside one's home, their car. And that wasn't why the hospitals were vacant. It was because SARS-22 was so lethal, quick, it, the people simply died from being at home or, or at work or, or driving without any warning. 
Were you ever tasked with helping dispose of the bodies of those that didn't make it to the hospitals? No. I was one of the fortunate ones and was never asked to help the National Guard with collecting the bodies from homes. But I did have to help transport body bags to the hospital morgue as we had an incinerator in the hospital basement. I remember one week we received so many body bags that we just had to leave them in the parking lot. And the smell, that is a smell that you never forget. You carry it with you and you want to forget it, but you can't. Just the other day, I thought of that smell in the shower and moments later, I was vomiting. It's been years, but that smell will never leave me. Not as long as I live. How many body bags were there in the hospital parking lot? A lot. And always more than we were equipped to handle. We received tens of thousands of body bags one day. Yet our staff and incinerator can only cremate a fraction of that at most in a given day. How long did it take you to clear those up? We never did. There were just too many body bags and more and more would show up every day. Eventually, the National Guard burned the bodies in the parking lot. Once we reached about 100,000, they decided to just douse the entire heap of bodies with petrol shot out of fire trucks. I remember standing there in my hazmat suit with a doctor and watching from a window and felt relief watching those bodies burn. Relief that the bodies were being taken care of? No. Relief to no longer have the smell of the dead. Our next interview takes us to the state of Michigan to speak with Peter Jensen. Hi, Peter. How exactly did you come to take part in the food riots? It was after my wife and children died from SARS-22. They died within days from each other. I'm sorry. How were you able to move forward from that? I didn't move forward from that. I did do what I had to do. I gave them a proper burial in the backyard. And then, I just waited for it. Waited for what? SARS-22. I knew it was coming for me, just waiting for the right moment to get me. Back then, I believed I would just die. I started waking up every morning, taking in every sunrise, like it was the last I'd ever see. Everything felt temporary. Every sound, every scent, every breath. I figured I'd had no warning like Liz or the kids. I'd just kneel over, fall down and die. But those days turned into weeks. Those weeks turned into months and I was still alive. I guess if if you spend all your time just sitting around waiting to die, there eventually comes a point when you realize you can't just live your life in fear. You can't just be afraid of death all the time. You have to go out and live while you can. While you still have time, other things can kill you too. Like depression or inaction. Why do you think you were able to survive the pandemics? For whatever reasons. 
due to the grace of God. I was spared from the pandemics. A friend of mine brought me to the city for the first food riots. He told me, unless we stand up and fight, we're not going to get a damn thing. I learned from him about how the banks had been holding the food supply of that year's harvest. Almost all of the farming capacity of the United States, hoping to export it to other countries to make a profit. And that our government was somehow perfectly okay with letting them do it, while people here were starving to death. At least SARS-22 would hit you fast. But hunger? Real hunger? There's no worse way to die than that. Most nursing homes were abandoned during the second pandemic due to a lack of staffing, and family members picked up their loved ones to care for them at home. But not every senior had a family to go home to. Our next interview takes us to the only remaining nursing home in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, to speak with Helen Sharp, once a resident and now the manager of the facility that looks after those left at her door. Hi, Helen. Can you tell us a little bit about how you got started in your role? Hi. That was back in 2022. I was a resident at this facility at the time. But by the second pandemic, no one came to check on us. And the last staff member to do so had died, along with the majority of the residents. There were only a few of us left. But we decided that we weren't going to wait around for help. We buried the dead. We cleaned the place up. We took stock of the supplies. One of the residents even went out for seed. We were never really afraid of SARS. Most of us were comfortable with the thought of dying. However, for some reason, we only had what felt like a minor cold. And afterward, the physical ailments that we were suffering from miraculously went away. Most of us feel 10 to 20 years younger since we came down with SARS. So we decided to keep the facility open and look after anyone that needed our help. Who comes to you for help these days? Mainly abandoned grandparents, sons or daughters, too tired to take care of someone with Alzheimer's or Parkinson's, or just tired of living with them. We'll drive here just to get rid of them. Often, They'll leave them on our front doorstep, wearing adult diapers. We never see the children, just the abandoned ones, who are often crying when we open the door. What happens then? We take them in. We care for them. In many cases, we console them since they've been abandoned by loved ones. I just don't understand this new generation, really. It's just for my generation and my parents, we weren't so selfish. We put our families first. Too many people these days, they're ready to run from the slightest problems and shut out anyone that they don't agree with. If you ask me, some of the wrong people died from SARS. How do you console these people left at your door to die? I, personally, I let them talk. 
you'd be amazed at how many of them went years without anyone wanting to listen to them. They often come to our facility confused, helpless, scared. But within a month, even if they're waiting for death the next day, there's that look in their eye that they are now content and they belong somewhere. They found a new family here and they're happy. For me personally, I don't think anyone should die without feeling that. Most of us will remember at the height of the pandemics, it became rare to see a plane in the sky. However, not all flights were grounded. We now go to New Delhi, India to talk with a former pilot who flew during the pandemics. Arjun, can you confirm your name and tell us your occupation for the camera? Hi, my name is Arjun Singh. I used to fly cargo planes for the Indian military services during 2024 pandemic. My job was to bring medical supplies to the other countries. Where did you travel during this time? Um, my job back then was flying to Rome, Moscow, Tel Aviv. And flying over the Middle East, what was that like? I had actually been flying over Iran when I saw one of the nukes go off. It was like a fireworks show from a plane. Only instead of bursts of sparks, uh, you saw bright intense lights below and heard distant rumbling like thunder. Some say that no one survived the fallout from that in Iran. What was it like flying after that? <laughs> well, I guess you could say it was surreal. All night the lights of the city and highway over Iran were gone. It was dark, as if you were flying over the ocean. <laughs> Sometimes we would bring our plane down to see what happened to Iran. If there, if there was anyone or anything left, but we could s never see anything. Many of us can recall a time when we could no longer call 911 because there was no one there to answer the call. However, not all officers left their jobs during the pandemics. We now travel to Sedona, Arizona to talk with a former policeman. Hello, Christopher. Can you tell us what it was like being a police officer during the pandemics? It was not fun. Most of the officers quit their jobs during the SARS-22 pandemic. Nobody wanted to be the one that arrested a suspected SARS case, then get sick, then potentially kill their entire family. Some of us stayed though, even after we stopped getting our paychecks. It was our moral duty as officers to protect the towns that we lived in. What did you have to do during that time? We certainly weren't handing out parking tickets by the end of 2022. No. Um, so during the second pandemic, my job quickly transitioned to one where I was basically just answering phones and helping people that were being attacked or robbed or raped. Basically just going out and helping anybody whose life was in jeopardy. How did you handle anyone breaking the law? Well, it all depended on the severity of the crime. If somebody was engaging in a minor offense, for example, I would just yell at them over the loudspeaker of my patrol car and just give them a warning. Most of the time they would just stop what they're doing and just run off and that'd be the end of it. I had to do that with a few looters actually. And to be honest, if the store owners had died, it would pretty much just be expected that the place would get looted, even by former officers of the law. It was at that point I didn't even bother with that anymore. And how did you deal with bigger offenses? Well, most people behaved rather responsibly and conscientiously. But when the prisons were all abandoned and most of the, a lot of the felons had escaped. Those were the people I usually had to deal with. And they were usually shoot to kill situations. I wouldn't even give them a warning. I would just pop them in the back of their head and leave them there for the coyotes. How did those things change during the third pandemic? At that point, all the bad apples had fallen from the tree and our town was safe. My job then was just to close off all the roads and make sure nobody tried to get in. Did anyone get in? Oh yeah, we've had a few stragglers from big cities that tried to get in. 
most likely trying to loot any of the abandoned houses for canned goods. But our solution to that was we would hang up what we called scarecrows, which were the dead bodies of the people that we shot. We would hang them up over the roads and the woods all over town, basically just as a way of saying, you know, if you enter our town, you will be shot. Police departments weren't the only first responders that had trouble with staffing during the second pandemic. Ambulances often sat idle in many American cities, but not in this city. Our next interview takes us to Catherine Stiles, who drove ambulances during the second pandemic. Hi, Catherine. What was it like to drive ambulances during the pandemic? It was interesting. Most of the ambulance drivers had died during the beginning of the second pandemic. So we were all recruited from a mental hospital. All of us were in there because we had made multiple attempts to kill ourselves. One day, these guys in suits came in during 2022 and they asked us if we wanted to leave the hospital and drive ambulances instead. What did you say? I said yes, and so did all the other patients. Who else was recruited to drive ambulances during the pandemics? Most of us were either suicidal or terminally ill patients, patients with cancer and other terminal diseases. We all just kind of said, fuck it, and drove the ambulances. It's been said that one of the reasons the hospitals closed was because no one would go to them after SARS-22. Did you find you were busy during the pandemics? We were busy, but our job wasn't driving sick people to the hospital. Most of the people that were sick were already dead during the second pandemic. So ambulances became what we called body bag wagons. People would call and report the smell of dead people. We would go to the houses, find the bodies, bag them up, and then drive them to the hospital to be incinerated. Eventually, the hospitals couldn't keep up with the number of body bags we were dropping off, so we had to bring them to landfills instead. Out of sight, out of mind. Did most of the people you worked with die? I think I'm the only survivor. One of the lucky ones. The sad thing is one of the people from the hospital came to me one day and she said that she was happy to be alive and that she regretted ever wanting to kill herself and that now her job gave her meaning and the next day she just up and dropped dead from SARS-22. Well, it looks like you're doing okay now, right? Keeping myself busy. <laughs> kind of about all you can do these days. At the start of the first pandemic, our economy had been in a period of transition for well over a decade. People unable to find well-paying jobs have been shut out of the real economy and forced to take remedial work for companies as delivery drivers, ride hailing services, and other things that often force them to take salaries below minimum wage and live a life of wage slavery. One survivor, Gan Moore, takes us to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania to recall his experience during the pandemic. Hi, Gan, can you tell us what you did before, during, and after the pandemics? Um, so before the pandemics, I, um, I drove my car for, uh, it was a ride hailing service, it was called Lightyear, and I never, I never made much, just enough to pay the gas, afford car repairs, put food on the table, <clears throat> excuse me. I, um, I lived at a friend's house, I slept on their couch, because from 2010 on, I, I, I'm not sure how anybody could afford rent. And it felt like, it felt like before the pandemics, every year rent prices just kept going up. It was another hundred each year, well each year you were lucky if you made as much as you did the year before. It got to a point where you could work 40 hours a week and you you would, would just make enough to pay your rent and, and nothing, nothing else. And how about during the pandemics? How did your job as a driver change? Well, I mean, we, we weren't employees. We were just what were called gig workers back then. So we had no benefits, no paid time off, no severance, no unemployment. I mean, it was, it was just the money from the work you could do. 
And what happened once there was no more work? Well, I mean, once there was no more people requesting rides, I mean, we had no way of making money. It was, it was a crazy time. No one, no one had ever dealt with anything like that before. And I think, I mean, the system, it's, it just broke. It just couldn't handle it. It just broke from all the stress and the strain. And at that point, people like me were, I mean, we were just left out. And how did you survive after that? Well, I was lucky. I had a friend. Helped me survive, gave me food, free place to stay. Many others were not. Um, we're not as lucky. And what about the second and third pandemics? My friend passed away during the second pandemic, so I took over his house. I've been living here since. Once the new government took over and President Yang instituted the minimum guaranteed income, I've been able to take it easy and not sell my soul to the ride hailing services like I had to do when I was younger. And now I spend my time teaching cello lessons online. Not everyone accepts the story that SARS was a natural or man-made, and some believe it's literally out of this world. Our next interview takes us to Billings, Montana, to speak with one of today's top online video celebrities who also happens to believe aliens caused the SARS pandemic. You are well known today as being a conspiracy theorist, the person who challenges the official narrative that Iran was the origin of SARS. How did you come to be known as the UFO guy or space alien nut as you're known in the news media today? First off, okay, before the revolution, I knew someone that worked at the Pentagon. His job was to investigate unexplained aerial phenomena. So much of what I've said over the years, it's from confidential information he provided to me while researching UFOs, okay? Many have said the reason your theories don't pan out is that they don't have any evidence to support them. Yes, I, I, I completely agree. Okay, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. However, all of the records and files that I would use to substantiate my claims were lost during the revolution when Washington DC burned to the ground. I mean, those fires took all of the evidence that we had collected for over a decade. And then most of the people who could corroborate my story mysteriously disappeared around 2027. So evidence aside, what is your theory about SARS? Okay, SARS was planted here by an extraterrestrial civilization. It was meant either to decimate our population as a warning so that we'd stop destroying our planet or, or it was the first part of a process to remove us from the earth. And what's the second part of that process? It's hard to say. I, I believe they see us like we see trees. I mean, to them, we're just these giant stationary objects that don't move. Or move really slowly and that they believe probably aren't intelligent. Akin to weeds that need to be removed. So, what exactly do you know? How did you arrive at your conclusions? They've been here for over two decades, our time but it's been thousands or even millions of years for them. They're not like anything we've seen in the movies. They don't experience time like we do. In fact, if we experience time like they do, a plank second of time would seem like a year, and the world around us would appear to have stopped and flow in very slow motion. You said they've been here for over two decades. How do you know that? Well, back in 2004, there was a Navy ship from the old American Republic, the USS Nimitz, I think it was called. Well, those fighter pilots were one of the first to even see them. I mean, they called them UFOs or unidentified flying objects. And there's video on the internet of them and, and radar picked them up like little Tic Tacs flying in the sky, defying the laws of physics. And the reason they defied the laws of physics is because time works differently for them. I mean, for the aliens, they could be walking around like you or I, but if we could see them, they'd be going insanely fast. Like that comic book character, The Flash, where we'd see nothing at all, and they'd see us like frozen statues. Right? The only way they'd see us move is if they did a time lapse. And how did you know that? 
well, in October 2017, I was hunting deep in these woods in Minnesota. And I heard what I thought was a freight train crashing or an explosion. And I thought when I got back to camp, I'd hear about it. Hear about what? I don't know. A, a, a terrorist attack, a plane crash, a factory somewhere blowing up. I mean, something that could explain what I heard. And I wasn't the only one to hear them. Mm -mm. Thousands of others heard them across the world, all throughout the summer and fall of 2017. I mean, back then, the news and the government couldn't connect the dots, but they called them skyquakes, right? the sound of explosions deep in the sky that no one could explain. You know, basically like a sonic boom. One scientist wrote in response to your theory that those sonic booms or skyquakes could have been explained by meteors exploding in the atmosphere or methane being released in the soil that then created those noises referred to as skyquakes as it escaped. How would you answer that? I would say use common sense. Okay, I heard the skyquake in October 2017, which also happened to be the month that the first interstellar object we ever detect passes by Earth. And it was on its closest approach to our planet. It, it was that asteroid with the, with the weird Hawaiian name, Oh, Muamua. Right, and that asteroid had a trajectory that took it past Venus, Earth, and Mars. I mean, what are the odds that the first object from another solar system that we ever detect takes the same path a vessel would take if it were looking to learn about the three potentially habitable planets in our solar system? And then, to top it off, for reasons no one can explain, that interstellar object suddenly starts accelerating as it leaves our solar system. If you ask me, that was one of their ships. It was dropping off baby probes that landed in our atmosphere and blew up before sending data back to the mama craft, making sure it was okay for the others coming down. I mean, the others arrived shortly thereafter. I mean, it's no surprise that just before the pandemic started, there were mass sightings of unexplained drone fleets in Colorado. That was them arriving. It, it wasn't some secret Iranian military drone operation, as some have alleged. It wouldn't be a truism to claim that healthcare has changed. Doctors today, like the rest of us, mainly work from home. Our next interview takes us to Providence, Rhode Island, to speak with one of the few medical professionals that survived SARS. Hi, Deborah. Can you please state your name and occupation for the camera? My name is Debbie. I'm a doctor with a private practice that offers in-home visits uh, with proper social distancing, of course. Um, I once worked for hospitals as well, uh, back when hospitals were still open. How would you describe the SARS pandemics as being someone who was on the front lines? I was originally a nephrologist, a doctor that treated kidney disease, but when the first SARS pandemic started, most elective procedures were put on hold. So I had to help with ventilators and assisting frontline staff at the hospitals treat and test the patients coming in. The first pandemic was a horrible thing to witness and the other two even more so due to the tragic toll they took on all of us. Being on the front lines, how were you able to avoid contracting SARS? I was always very careful. I always wore protective gear, but even protective gear is no guarantee against SARS. Many of my colleagues came down with the disease and did not survive despite the best preventative measures. Do you think the pandemics are officially over? Back in 2021, I'd have told you yes, they are over. Then again, in 2023, I'd have told you yet again, this is finally over. Life can go back to normal now, but after SARS-24, I think almost everyone in the world has been scarred. We all now feel this will never end. The bad news will just keep coming. Somewhere, another crazy individual in another crazy government will find another way to terrorize the world and people will just keep dying until there's no one left. Maybe though, maybe this time can be different. We can only hope. 
hospitals weren't the only things that closed. And while mostly everyone was in a state of constant fear regarding SARS-22, a new source of panic emerged in 2022 when prisons were abandoned by their staff and inmates, some of them violent, escaped. Online stories of home invasions led to the biggest increase in gun sales in recorded history. And lawmakers of the time even introduced legislation allowing for the purchase of weapons and ammunition online with no age limit nor restrictions. However, not all of those that escaped the prisons were a boon to society. Some like Jeff found a new role in the post-pandemic world order. We now travel to Carthage, Missouri. Hi Jeff, can you please state your name and occupation for the camera? My name is Jeff. No. I'd rather not give my full name or age, if you don't mind. I don't have an occupation. I just live in an abandoned house that was left by someone who died during the 2022 pandemic. I grow my own food, um, family and I develop. I'm a former inmate. Since I escaped prison, basically survived on my own. No family survived. No friends, it's basically impossible to meet anyone these days. And when you do, you have to worry if they have it. Have what? Sauce. Every now and then you get people going out. The hungries, I call them. Try to steal from you, take your food. Since there's no police, at least not these parts. How do you deal with the people trying to steal the food you grow? I kill them. Is that what you were an inmate before, before, for killing? No. Well, yeah, I guess. I got in a fight with a guy at a bar. We both had a few too many drinks. We went outside and pushed over my motorcycle. One thing you never do is touch another man's bike. I mean, you could punch a guy. Sure thing, go ahead, have at it. But throw another man's holly to the ground, well, that's a death sentence. So I went in, stabbed him in the neck. I didn't mean for him to die. Just wanted to give him a flesh wound and stay at the hospital, make him think about ever touching my bike. But then he did end up dying. They threw me in the slammer. That was 2014. How long were you sentenced for? A very long time. How did you get out early? It was the 2022 pandemic. Uh, they'd released most of the druggies and white collar guys and us hardcore violent offenders were left behind bars. Most of us died in there from SARS, but not all. Most of the guards died too. Every day there was fewer and fewer of them showing up. The inmates that died in their cells, just left them in there to rot. Didn't take care of the bodies or anything. Then one day, nobody showed up at all. Then the lights went out. I thought we were going to die. And maybe after a few weeks of the power going out, the doors just opened up. A family member of one of the inmates in there had come to check on him, realized the prison had been abandoned and no one was caring for us or looking after us. That, was, uh, that man knew the grace of our Lord Jesus and let us out. What did you do then? My first impulse was to leave. Uh, go find my old girlfriend, even my ma, but I was very hungry. A few weeks eating rats will have that effect. So I went and looked for some food. There's no food in the prison. And so me and a few of the other inmates, we went to a nearby town. It looked like the town was deserted, so we split up and went into houses. And we were really hungry. Did you find anything? No, oh, not that day. But when I met back up with the other inmates, this one guy says, Jeffrey, I found something better than food. What did he find? He takes me and the guys to this house and opens the door. And there's this lady. He assaulted her and killed her. Ate part of her face. She's just lying in a pool of blood. Blood is everywhere. It's leaking out of her head. Part of her face that wasn't eaten. Yeah, she looked like she'd seen a ghost. 
and he just looks at us and smiles, telling us how good it felt, how he kept some leftovers for us. And what did you do? I may have stabbed the guy in the neck, but that was different. This guy had no place in the world. I mean, me and the other inmates, we'd done our time. We changed. But this guy hadn't. So we looked at each other and we knew what we had to do. What did you do? Well, the other guys grabbed him by the arms and took him down and, and he screamed and, and fought and resisted. And, and I climbed on top of him and I grabbed him around the throat. And I strangled that son of a bitch. And I didn't let go till his face turned blue and I knew he was dead. And then we buried that poor lady he murdered, gave her proper burial. And we left his body in that house, burned it down. How did you eventually come to find the house and farmland you now live in? Well, after that, uh, we all split up, went our separate ways. Some went to look for food or family members that may have survived the whole mess or whatnot. And so I headed to Memphis, Tennessee, where my old girlfriend used to live, hoping I'd find a meal or two along the way. And how long did you go without food? Oh, not long. I found a, a dead possum on the side of the road, and at least I think it was dead. Never can tell with possums. Cooked it on a campfire. Didn't exactly taste very good, but when a man is hungry, it tastes the last thing on his mind. Hunger, real hunger, few people experienced before the pandemics. But when you get the hunger, as they call it, there's nothing you wouldn't do. Nothing you wouldn't eat. Put out that fire in your belly. What happened after that? came across a roadblock. One of the, the ones certain towns put up to keep people out from bringing in SARS. And I told them my story and how I'd gotten out of prison and was on my way to Memphis. First, the guys told me to just go away. But when I told them I was on my way to Memphis, one of them opened up, said I shouldn't go to Memphis. Said most of the people there were dead. And it'd be a death sentence if I walked there. Now one guy, he was a judge. Now just a guy guarding a road. Said if I help protect that road, protect that town, they'd help me find a house and a farm outside of town. And my sentence would be commuted and I'd be a free man as long as I help protect that community. And so I stayed there for the last seven years. What happened after that? I helped guard that role the first couple of years. Helped keep sick people out while avoiding the people that live there. Somehow, even though we protected that road, SARS-24 got in. Maybe it was a bat or a rat, something. Even one of those nasty possums. But everyone in that town died in 2024. I was the only one left. I've been here ever since. Growing my own crops, keeping them myself. Helps that the power and internet and phones came on last year. It's not the best life. It gets pretty lonely at times. But at least I made up for my wrongs. At least I'm not hungry. <laughs> at least I'm not dead. Not everyone accepts SARS was to blame for the four billion deaths the last decade. We now cross the ocean to England to speak with one of the scientific community's brightest minds, considered by many to be the next Stephen Hawking. His magnum opus, Black Holes Are Not Black, and They Are Not Holes, They Are Just Flat and Taste Like Pancakes. Top the bestseller list two years in a row. 
Professor James, you have earned yourself a reputation as the leading proponent of the theory that SARS virus was well, not real, but a man-made hoax, and despite receiving a PhD from the University of Surrey, received a prison sentence for arson when you tried to destroy 5G cell towers in 2021. Can you tell us why you believe that 5G was responsible for people dying? Well, I didn't think I said that 5G kills people, but it does give you really bad headaches. And then it just makes you want to walk off somewhere, I suppose. So how does that result in those people dying? Well, isn't it obvious? Because the Earth is flat. Actually, the world isn't flat. No, it is. It's quite flat. I studied this. Two lockdowns of study, study, study. I like to challenge the greats. I'm a man of science. But even the greats get challenged. I went back to what I could tangibly see. I could see the horizon is flat. I prepared some slides for you. Look, look, look. Flat. 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 It's quite flat. Well, you are entitled to that opinion. So are you saying that people had headaches, left their homes, and then walked off the edge of the world? Yeah, of course. It's a travesty. If they were in England, wouldn't they have reached the Atlantic Ocean? Oh, yeah, of course. But they'd have to swim a little bit first before they fell off. Wouldn't they have to swim across the ocean, you know, to reach America? <laughs> Good one, good one. You're not one of those people that believes in America too. Well, how would you explain my accent? Well, evidently, you're an actor. Back in 2020, not everyone thought SARS was a hoax and the earth was flat. In fact, most people at the time thought the virus came from a wet market in Shanghai, China, or one of the Chinese labs researching the SARS family of viruses. Our next interview takes us to Shenzhen, China. Dr. Li, you worked at the Wuhan Institute of Virology in China between 2017 and 2020, correct? Correct. I love technician. Study fecal matter of many bats. When the first SARS-19 virus pandemic broke out in Shanghai and caused that city to be locked down for five months, some people thought that the virus may have originated from your lab in Wuhan. How would you respond to that? We never deal with sample of SARS-19. Many similar virus, but not anything like SARS-19. Some online articles state that in 2017, one of your associates at the Institute was arrested. Did you witness that? And what did that have to do with the SARS-19 pandemic? It's true. Uh, once he arrested, uh, they claim he worked with several Iranians as consultant in a cave in North China. Uh, but they never tell us why he arrested and why he taken away. Uh, the only rumor. What was it like in China during those pandemics? It's very awful. Uh, factory closed, uh, many shops, uh, no paid worker, uh, no open again. Uh, many died during second and third pandemics. China wasn't the only country that suffered. All countries suffered. Europe suffered, some of the highest death tolls especially. Our next interview takes us to Vienna, Austria, to talk with a woman who experienced the pandemics firsthand in Europe. Hallo, Frau Kreisler. Ich spreche nur ein bisschen Deutsch. Wie war es in Europa während der Pandemien? Ich denke, dass es am Anfang wahrscheinlich recht ähnlich wie in China oder in Amerika war. Ich selber habe damals in der Schweiz gelebt und in der Schweiz war die erste Pandemie nicht so schlimm wie in Italien oder in Frankreich zum Beispiel. Und erst als dann der iranische Krieg begann, da hat sich dann plötzlich alles verändert. Die Schweiz, die seit über 500 Jahren ein neutrales Land war, ist der NATO beigetreten und hat Frankreich, Deutschland und Großbritannien geholfen, Truppen in den Osten zu schicken, um die iranische Bedrohung zu stoppen. Und 
ja, ich würde sagen, dass sich von da an dann alles verändert hat. Die Schweizer Lebensweise war von heute auf morgen einfach weg. Sie sagen, während der zweiten Pandemie hatten Wellen Infizierte, Flüchtlinge aus dem Nahen Osten die Zahl der äh, Todsopfer in West- und Nordeuropa höher gemacht als anderswo auf der Welt. Wie war es, das zu schauen? Ja, das war wirklich, wirklich schrecklich. Nachdem die österreichischen und tschechischen Grenzen überschritten waren, da wurde uns allen klar, dass die Flüchtlinge nicht mehr aufzuhalten waren, SARS-22 überall zu verbreiten. Sogar die Grenzschutzbeamten mit ihren Maschinengewehren und Stacheldrahten, nichts konnte die Flüchtlinge mehr aufhalten. Es waren, es waren einfach viel zu viele Menschen. Und es war nicht nur eine humanitäre Krise. Die, die Flüchtlinge wussten, dass sie nicht in die Städte gehen konnten, weil sie da erschossen wurden. Also haben sie sich überall in den Wäldern und in den Bergen versteckt. Und sogar während der dritten Pandemie hat man die Kinder noch gewarnt, dass sie auf keinen Fall im Wald spielen dürfen oder in den Bergen wandern dürfen, weil es irgendwo noch ein kranker Flüchtling versteckt sein könnte. Es wurde wie ein grausames neues Krimmärchen mit diesen schrecklichen Flüchtlingsmonstern im Wald, die einen die Kinder und das Leben stehlen könnten, nur weil sie in der Nähe von einem atmen würden. Und ich würde sagen, es war wahrscheinlich auch viel schlimmer als die syrische Flüchtlingskrise davor, weil die meisten Flüchtlinge sind im Winter gestorben. Und sogar heute noch haben die Menschen Angst, im Winter in den Alpen Ski zu fahren, weil irgendwo es noch Leichen geben könnte, die SARS-24 und SARS-22 noch heute verbreiten würden. Es ist wirklich eine ganz eine schreckliche Situation. Wie haben Sie die Pandemien überlebt? Ich war 27, als meine Eltern während der zweiten Pandemie gestorben sind. Und in meiner Stadt, in der ich damals gelebt hatte, in der Schweiz, da sind die meisten Menschen zwischen ein und zwei Wochen gestorben. Und ich hatte einen Verwandten in der Stadt, er war der Sohn von einem Freund von meinem Vater, der Harry, der stand eines Tages vor meiner Tür und hat mir davon erzählt, dass er seinen Vater gerade verloren hat und er seine Mutter nicht finden konnte. Also habe ich ihm versprochen, dass ich ihm helfen würde, seine Mutter zu finden. Und wir haben dann während der Woche haben wir versucht, die Mutter zu finden, leider ohne Erfolg und mussten dann feststellen, dass wir beide noch die einzigen Überlebenden in der ganzen Stadt waren. Ja, so saßen wir dann da in der leeren Kirche und haben geweint. Und die Eltern und unsere Verwandten, die wir verloren hatten. Und da legte Harry plötzlich seinen Arm um mich und äh, er hat mir davon erzählt, dass seine Eltern ein Grundstück in Montagnola besaßen, welches bestimmt noch für ein Jahr Vorräte hätte und ähm, so haben wir dann beschlossen, nach Montagnola zu gehen, um die Pandemie abzuwarten. Konnten Sie nach Montagnola kommen? Ja, und wir hatten Glück, dass, äh, dass wir nicht zu Fuß gehen mussten. Da es immer noch Güterzüge zwischen der Schweiz und Italien gab, konnten wir dann mit so einem Zug nach Montagnola reisen und äh, kamen dann da zum Grundstück von Harrys Eltern. Harry ist dann nach zwei Jahren gestorben und ich blieb dann da bis 2027, bis die dritte Pandemie vorbei war und habe dann eine Stelle bei den Vereinten Nationen in Wien angenommen. Und ja, heute bin ich noch eine der wenigen Glücklichen, die in der Welt herumreisen kann und so verbringe ich jetzt die Zeit zwischen der Schweiz Österreich und den USA. We now travel back to the United States to talk with one of the most influential figures in politics and education today. I'm Professor Hilfer, Director of Televised Education for the National Educational Foundation. Before that, I was a professor of English literature at Harvard. You're often known in the media today as the principal. Why is that? Yes, I've 
heard that expression. I think it's due to the fact that education has changed and adapted so much over the last 10 years, and I've been at the forefront of its evolution. It's very survival at a time most of us wish had never happened, at a time when most of us lost many we loved. How have you been at the forefront? Well, back in 2022, after our beloved President Trump died of SARS-22 and after a national month of mourning, Vice President Bernie Sanders, if you remember, he took over from Michael Pence when he died of SARS-22 a month before that. And even though we called him Crazy Bernie back then, soon to be President Sanders called me up on the phone and he said, Carol, I need you to help make America's educational system great again. How did you respond to that? I said, okay, how would you like me to do that? What did he say? He said, Carol, I'm going to leave that up to you. What do you suggest? I told him that I thought we should take over the television airspace and start broadcasting lessons so that every child can receive their lessons on broadcast channels 4 through 14, depending on their grade level. Well, he said, that's unacceptable. We need channels 4 through 24 so that college can be free too. I said, great, let's do that. So that's how televised at homeschooling began. Yeah, pretty much. The broadcast stations weren't exactly thrilled about having their channels sequestered from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m., but they wound up making more money on commercials during those breaks than they ever did during soap operas, I imagine. That program was considered the most successful educational program in the modern era. What do you think that is? The quality of education that we used and the fact that we had an organized online study and testing component available to every student and that every kid had a pass in order to get food. And we made learning fun. We made things like chemistry and calculus easy. Basic math was more accessible to the little ones. They didn't find it a chore when they were being taught their lessons from Sesame Street characters. And parents farming at home didn't mind that their kids were glued to educational programming while they tended to their crops and livestock. And at a time when the government didn't have very much money, it saved money as well. A lot of money. And we made sure that only the best educators were responsible for the education of our children nationwide. You were one of the few people and programs the new government retained after the revolution. Why is that? Because we've never been politically biased. We've never been about supporting corporations or the wealthy at the expense of those left out of the system, which is what caused the riots and then the revolution. We've always been about education and making sure that our kids receive their lessons, good moral guidance, and that they learn analytical and decision-making skills so that they can decide for themselves what is right. I think when the new Continental Congress initiated direct democracy so the US Constitution could be restored after decades of neglect and abuse, and when they prohibited organizations and individuals from donating to campaigns and ads and set a new standard for education for those running for office moving forward, President Yang realized that we were part of the solution and not part of the problem. Education isn't the only thing that has changed. The way we record history is also experiencing a revolution. Our next interview takes us to Charleston, South Carolina to speak with Professor James Sampson. Hi, why did you decide to specialize in the SARS pandemic? For the same reason Thucydides decided to write about the Peloponnesian Wars in ancient Greece. History was happening. Thucydides knew that what he wrote down would be remembered for all time so long as it was recorded, and that someone needed to create a reliable record of it. Most will not take the trouble to find out the truth, but will just accept the first story they hear. I, I want to make sure that future generations hear the right story. And what have you found? The Iranians didn't release SARS-19 in 2019. The disease really should be called SARS-15 because it was 2015 that they released it. Tell us about the evidence you found. For starters, for those old enough to recall the rapprochement with Cuba when Americans and Cubans restored diplomatic relations, there was a scandal about sonic weapons targeting embassy staff in 2017. Now the Cubans denied knowing anything about it, and for good reason, because it was the Iranians that were experimenting on new weapons. And in 2020, when they fired a missile at an American base in Iraq, and troops there suffered head injuries, 
The Americans didn't know it at the time, but the Iranians had launched a chemical weapon that released that toxin on those poor American soldiers. So what does the neural weapon have to do with SARS-19? Well, that story in particular was just meant to show how the Iranians were going about attacking America. They never attacked directly, only indirectly, using things that no one could prove they were doing. As for SARS, the Iranians had really poor intelligence. I mean, they were awful at intelligence collecting, just like they were bad at designing bioweapons. The Revolutionary Guard wanted to attack anyone who they thought was involved with the CIA. And for whatever reasons, they decided an American novelist, Arthur Schopenhauer, was a central intelligence agency asset and decided to target him. We now travel to Galena, Illinois to speak with Arthur Schopenhauer, the once famous novelist known online as Patient Zero. Hi Arthur. There are some circles in the medical and intelligence communities that believe you are Patient Zero, that the Iranian Revolutionary Guard targeted and infected you with SARS-19. How does your personal experience line up narrative? Well, uh, back in 2015, I, I was living just north of New Orleans in this uh, North Shore town called uh, Mandeville. But then there were these two weird men that uh, they would follow me around like everywhere I went. They were outside my home. They would they'd park out there and something something was clearly going on. What did those two men look like? Uh, just m Middle Eastern men. Always smoking, though. I, I'd see them, I'd look through my window at night. I mean, they'd be there all day, but I'd look at my window at night and see these two men sitting in a parked car alone with the, the embers from their cigarettes glowing in the night, and that was it. And that was every day. That was every day these guys were there. And I... I mean, I, I figured they were criminals. I figured they, they, they were going to do something, but I had no idea that they were Iranian agents. How did you know you were being followed? Well, I mean, first off, they followed me everywhere I went. I'd go to the store and they'd be, you know, a couple cars behind and then they'd be in the parking lot. They followed me everywhere. But um, what was really eerie is that I would call the police and say that there's a couple of guys following me and they would come to the house and right before the police car got there, the Iranians would drive away. And then right when the police car left, the Iranian car would come right back. So it's like they knew what I was doing, but I did get a, a picture of the license plate uh, and I showed it to the police officer one day. And years later, they told me that um, the, the name associated with that driver's license had been, that guy had been arrested, finally had been arrested and, and had been uncovered as an Iranian agent. So that's when I found out about that. A CIA operation in 2022 found evidence that you were infected in 2015 by Iranian agents. What were the first symptoms of SARS-19 that you experienced? Well, one week I just started feeling off and each night I'd be short of breath. And then one night I had a stroke. Uh, I was watching TV and uh, all of a sudden I, I, I couldn't understand what, what the person on the TV was saying. And then I, I tried to like say something myself, but I, I couldn't, it was just gibberish, you know? And I thought, holy shit, I'm dying. I'm dying, I mean, what? because I'm, I'm sitting there watching the TV and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to talk, but it's just coming out gibberish. Why did you not go to a hospital? I'm more afraid of a hospital bill than death. <laughs> How did you recover from SARS? Oh, no, I, I never recovered from SARS. I mean, even now I have an itchy throat and uh, I have to take an inhaler twice a day. Otherwise, my blood oxygen level is too low. For me, SARS began as a stroke, but I would get random bouts of pneumonia. And in 2018, I had a cough for the entire year. And so that made me think uh, that maybe I'd gotten tuberculosis in 2017. I'd been in China in 2017. I thought maybe, no, well, maybe that's what this is. 
But I was concerned, and so I did overcome my fear of, uh, of hospitals, and I, I did go to see a doctor, and they did all these tests, and they told me, actually, no, um, you have SARS. Why do you think the Iranians targeted you? Do you believe it's because you were famous as the proud owner of a celebrity cat? <laughs> well, I mean, I guess the Iranians are always chanting death to America, right? Maybe they're actually chanting death to American cats. <laughs> but uh, now mo most people think it's because they mistook me for, uh, for a CIA agent. And why do you think that they thought you worked for the CIA? Well, uh, you know, as, as most of you know, b before all the pandemics, I was a pretty famous author. And I had written a book, which a guy named Saeed Sabazian in Iran, he translated that into Farsi in 2004. And that translation was banned by the Iranian government. And so he emailed me and he was complaining about the situation there with the book being banned. And I emailed him back and I said, look, dude, you should start a revolution, right? Because I think any country that restricts the freedom of speech of its people, there's got to be change. And um, obviously the Iranians were monitoring his emails and so they saw, they saw what I said to him and they took it really seriously. And I think that they thought that I was trying to incite a revolution over there. And so they figured that you know, I must work for the CIA. When did you first realize that you might be patient zero? Back in 2022, uh, I'd been living in a rural area and these two men in suits showed up and knocked at my door. And, and I, I had been recovering from SARS and they just, uh, they just showed up. These were different than the two men in Louisiana? Oh, no, it was totally different. I mean, they, they weren't sketchy, but, but honorable looking, you know? They were clearly government officials. And, uh, I mean, one of them, I'll never forget, one of them pulls out this badge and it says Department of Defense. <laughs> How often does that happen, I mean? But so I, I knew that they were uh, on the level. And what did these men say to you? They asked me all these questions about my, my case, my symptoms, and, and my cat, if, if my cat had symptoms, they, they asked about the Middle Eastern men that had followed me around. And then, um, a helicopter flies down and lands, and these men in hazmat suits come, and they take my blood, and then they take my cat. <laughs> Took my cat? Okay. And then, um... They, they loaded up into the helicopter and uh, they flew, they flew away. Did they say anything else to you? Well, one of... <laughs> one of them looked me right in the eye and he said, You never can tell. I was ever going to see my cat again. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I asked if I'd see my cat again, and he just shrugged like he didn't even know. <laughs> and then they they left. I, 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 oh, I still haven't seen my cat. <laughs> <laughs> they won't let me. <laughs> I just want to see my cat. <laughs> they won't let me. <sighs> Before the pandemics, your cat was actually considered a celebrity of sorts. Can you tell us about that? Most of your older viewers will probably uh, remember. But for, for the young ones, um, a, little, a little history lesson on my cat. I, I first adopted him uh, to, to be a model for this graphic novel that I was doing called The Nightmarish Tales from the Beyond. And I was going to sketch him into the novel and it was a total failure. But 
he did get attention, the cat, from the book. Some people found him, and they started putting him in Hollywood movies. And, uh... <laughs> I mean, before you know it, he was a star. Really big in Japan, too. He was, uh... Really big over there. Our next interview takes us to a laboratory in Chicago, Illinois, where scientists are studying cats infected with SARS. Hi, Dr. Bell. You're known as a specialist that treats pets infected with SARS. How did you gain that reputation? Back when the government was investigating the origin of SARS, they brought this cat to me that they wanted to confirm whether or not it was patient ground zero for the SARS-19 pandemic. And did you confirm it? We did. Uh, for whatever reason, both the cat and the person that was first exposed never actually suffered the fatal effects of SARS. And from what I understand, they have had some ongoing respiratory issues, but nothing like the SARS-22 pandemic when millions of pets perished. Why do you think so many pets died during the SARS-22 pandemic? I think they were silent carriers. Whoever designed SARS designed it so children and pets would carry and spread the disease, but be asymptomatic. And so as a result, most dogs that were allowed to roam freely and they weren't leashed became carriers in 2020 and then died in 2022. What will happen to patient zero? That cat was once a worldwide celebrity, but is now under your institute's care. Well, we certainly keep him here for observation. But as you'll see in this video, he hasn't aged a bit in 10 years. In fact, for a cat, he should actually be dead based on his age, but it looks like those who survived SARS enjoy some nice perks. Such as? SARS-19 appears to lower one's metabolism and slow the aging process considerably. In fact, those that survived the pandemic may very well find that the aging process has stopped completely. Now, we're still trying to understand this process and how it works, but it appears that the virus interferes with the genes responsible for aging. And that's why so many people in Hollywood that didn't want to grow old injected themselves with SARS-19 back in 2021, hoping it would allow them to stay young. Did it work? No, most of them died. You see, we found that you need to have a special genetic predisposition to have any chance of beating SARS. Otherwise, it's just gonna lay latent in your spinal fluid and one day it's gonna activate and kill you. Kind of like how HIV turns into AIDS. And that was one of the things that we learned in 2024, that those that were taking antiviral medication for HIV survived up till 2025 when the medication ran out, when the supply chain collapsed those years, all of them eventually succumbed to SARS. So antiviral meds only prevented SARS-22 from activating. They actually never allowed the body to beat it. However, the cats that we're studying here have a genetic predisposition that we hope one day is going to allow us to find a permanent cure for SARS for both people and pets. Pets weren't the only ones we lost during the pandemics. For many of us, entire families and communities were lost. Our next interview brings us to Port Orange, Florida, to speak with a former high school teacher who experienced firsthand the brutality of the SARS-22 pandemic. Hi, Ms. Proust. Can you please state your name and occupation for the camera? Hi, I'm Susan, and I... not really anything these days. What did you do before the pandemics? I was a high school teacher. I taught French and Spanish courses. So you most likely stopped teaching around 2022 then? Yes. Once the education system was nationalized, as most local governments were broke and couldn't afford to pay teachers anymore, I was laid off. But I wasn't alone, as mostly everyone then was unemployed. How did you feel about that? When my family was still alive, I didn't really feel bad about it. Our house was paid off and we didn't have any debt. Most of our savings were used by then, but we didn't have to worry about being evicted or the banks taking our homes like other people did. I felt that it was a challenge, but one that we would get through with time. But then SARS-22 hit and that all changed. How did it change? First, my husband, then my children died. Suddenly and without warning. Grieving alone is a terrible thing. Almost as bad as burying the ones you love. 
And all I had in 2022 was grief. Thankfully, my friends were supportive and would stop by, keep me occupied. We'd garden, talk, and that helped me heal a bit. But then in 2024, my friends began to die until I was the only one left, except some farmers on the other side of town. I was alone again. That's all I've been since everyone I've loved has died. Alone. Excuse me. We now travel to New Berlin, Wisconsin, to speak with Amy Jackson. She lost her parents and family as well during the pandemics. Hi, Amy. Can you tell us a little bit about your experience during the pandemics and, and what it was like in Wisconsin? Well, um, I was in junior high when the first pandemic hit. It was just after Valentine's Day and I had been looking forward to our school's dance, but then school shut down and everything was canceled. The most businesses closed over the next year or two. I mean, especially when the second pandemic hit, it was, it was a pretty scary time. What happened to your parents? I don't know. My mom just disappeared with her new boyfriend one day. They said they were going to his vacation home out west, but I wasn't allowed to come with, so they left me all by myself, age 15, in her apartment during the middle of the second pandemic. I never heard from her again. Our next interview takes us back to China to speak with Mao Yin, a survivor of the pandemics. What was it like to experience the pandemics in China?虽然其他国家疫情的恶化，大多数的订单也停止了。到了二零二一年，很多工厂都倒闭了。我们大多数人都来自农村，本想。it is said that outside of Europe, China was hit the hardest by the second pandemic. What was your experience of the second pandemic in China? In the did you stay in the village? No. Hotsuan 可是有一天，他像平常一样出去打猎，就再也没有回来过。What did you do then? 那时，政府
，开始空投粮食，给村里的人们吃。我不知道这些，因为我已经在山洞里过了一年。只是，当我的丈夫失踪以后，我又重新回到了村庄。我想带点食物回去。村里除了我以外，所有的人都死了。空投的食物足够我维持生命，直到二零二七年，我才又见到其他的人。那时，空投停止了，但是军车进了村，他们告诉我。大瘟疫结束了，我便搭他们的车到了附近的城市。从那时候起，我就一直在找我的丈夫和儿子。但我知道，他们已经不在人世了。Loneliness is a terrible thing, but it is almost always the result of the choices we make. However, for some people in the New World Order, to live and die alone is no longer a choice, but a lifelong sentence. We now travel to Palo Alto, California, to speak with one woman who has experienced this firsthand. Hi, Charlotte. You are known as one of the first people to have been sentenced for a crime since the changes to the criminal justice system occurred. Can you tell us what you were sentenced for and what your punishment is? I was a nanny before the pandemic started. I was falsely accused of murdering the mother of the children I was caring for during the second pandemic. The prosecutor stated in their complaint that I wanted to be the children's new mommy. Even though I did become their new mommy, as I married their dad, it didn't matter. Because they all died of SARS in 2024. Their father, my ex-husband, left a confession in his will stating that I had killed his wife, and that he was afraid I would kill all of them if he said anything. So about a year ago, these soldiers came to my house. Charged me with a crime, arrested and sentenced me. What was your sentence? I was sentenced to a life at home. I can't leave for any reason. I can't even walk the dog. What if there's a fire or something that forces you to leave your house? They installed a device in my head that uses GPS. If I leave for any reason, it'll detect it. My head will explode, and I will die. They do allow you to go about ten feet from the property line, so if there was. A fire. I would probably be okay waiting outside. From what I understand, there's a loud beeping sound if you get too close to the edge, warning me before my head explodes. During the pandemics, many refused to fly, not because they were scared of catching SARS, but because of rumors of what airline personnel would do to anyone that failed a temperature check-in flight. Our next interview takes us to sunny Los Angeles to speak with Kaylee, an airline attendant who was one of the few people still employed through all three pandemics. Hi, Kaylee. What was it like to be an airline attendant during the pandemics? Well, I was furloughed at the start of the first pandemic, but by the end of 2020, the airports needed people to conduct tests at the security gates. So I was brought back on to do nasal swabs for the few people still flying. How did you like that? I hated it. <laughs> I absolutely hated it. 
I always saw myself as a free bird and I wanted to be up in the air. Definitely not stuck in an airport full of potentially infected people. How long did you have to do nasal swaps? When the economy never restarted and things were looking pretty bad, I expected to lose my job as there were fewer and fewer flights each month. Did you lose your job? Fortunately not. <sighs> well, most of the other airlines went out of business and Southeast was the only one left standing. So when the government mandated in-flight temperature checks and testing, I was given my old job back. But your job changed considerably, correct? Oh, you bet. <laughs> it was no longer bringing people soda and peanuts. <laughs> but I did get to dress up in a fancy hazmat suit. How did your airline survive the 24 pandemic? I really don't know. At a certain point, we really were just transporting medical workers and senators and those types. And the empty seats and luggage racks would often be filled with medical equipment. No one else was allowed to fly in 2022 and 23. And they started paying us in peanuts instead of money too. And because the grocery stores were shut down, we were literally happy to be paid in peanuts. <laughs> Although I would have preferred pistachios, but I mean, really, I was just happy to be back in the air. <laughs> what did you do when you found someone was infected with SARS-22 or SARS-24 during a flight the next two years? Well, uh, I wouldn't really like to talk about that. <laughs> Why is that? Well, you know, um, I've, I've just all, uh, I've just always deplored the fact that sick people just had to go. What do you mean? Well, the motto of the airline was the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few, and we took that to heart. All of us. We didn't want one sick person getting the other 10 or 20 people on the flat sick, so we had to remove them from the plane, even if we were 30,000 feet up. Now, if I found someone had a high temperature, my job was to alert the air marshal. His job then was to take that person and put them in a quarantine cabin in the back. How did the quarantine cabin start? first things the airlines had to do was remove the toilets on planes. People could no longer go to the bathroom while in the air. If they had to go potty, well, they just had to release it into their hazmat suit, like an old person stuck at the opera. After the revolution, the government banned the use of quarantine cabins on planes, but very few people that flew during the pandemics ever talked about them. What exactly were the quarantine cabins? Well, they created the quarantine cabins to replace the restroom on the plane. And once we put somebody in there and shut the door and locked it, the floor would open up and they'd fall out of the plane. So they died. Well, yeah, I mean, some of them maybe. But it's not like we were throwing people out of planes like a train might do with someone without a ticket. We were very humane about it. How is throwing someone that just has a high temperature out of an airplane considered humane? We gave them parachutes, silly. There's no question the world has changed. The question is, how much has it changed? Our next interview takes us to Iowa, where Senator Brown has agreed to share how he got into politics during the pandemics. Senator Brown, could you please state your name and occupation for the record? Well, my name is Michael Brown. I'm a senator from Iowa. I'm originally from Texas, but left Texas for Iowa in 2022 when there was a call for people to help out with farming. I've been here since and haven't looked back. Not since I saw what happened in Houston during the second pandemic. How did you get involved in politics? I didn't ask to be a politician. I wound up joining the food riots after President Sanders died due to SARS-24 and the leader of the House illegally seized power. Hard to imagine that was only five years ago, but like most Americans back then, I was disgusted about what happened and what was happening. How did your movement form into an army? During 2025, we were basically a hungry mob, not an army. 
For those that study history, it really felt like we were reliving the French Revolution, with Hillary Clinton playing the part of Robespierre. Only, after the reign of terror was over, instead of Napoleon, we had Senator Yang, who wound up becoming the first president of the new Republic of America. I think our movement was purely organic and just organized naturally. We never really thought of ourselves as an army, but as protesters wanting to restore the government back from those that seized it. We saw ourselves protecting the country from its own domestic enemies, and we didn't give a damn about dying from SARS when we marched on Washington, D.C. Many of you died when the army fired on you. What was that like? It was scary, but after living through the SARS pandemic, I don't think any of us were scared of death at that point. When the other army units stopped following orders to shoot the protesters, who were protesting the fact that our farm fields were being plundered by banks, well, and when those units turned on those that fired on the protesters, that's when we knew things were changing. That a revolution, the first in hundreds of years, was happening in America. It was quick, and the change in power went without hiccups. After all, we weren't trying to set up a new government, but just restoring the one that had been taken from us quietly over the last 50 years by corporations and lobbyists. You're known as an avid reader. What book has most inspired your political philosophy? Well, I'm a big fan of Jean-Jacques Rousseau. He was a Genevan philosopher who influenced the progress of enlightenment throughout Europe. He had a really good saying that I liked. I prefer liberty to danger than peace with slavery. Do you have a favorite book? Thomas Piketty's book, Capital in the 21st Century, was fairly influential when I was younger, but I also just read a book, One Dimension Man, by Herbert Marcuse. It's a great read and I highly recommend it. I believe Carol Hilfer, who runs the educational program for our great nation, is making it required e-reading for all 12th graders. I'd like to say more, but I have to go now. So, goodbye.